Welcome to Real World Perspectives on Poverty Solutions. I'm Trevor Bechtel, facilitator of this series with Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan and instructor of the course that accompanies this lecture series. Over these seven weeks, we have introduced key issues regarding the causes and consequences of poverty in this virtual space, featuring experts in policy and practice from across the nation. We are an audience of students enrolled in our course, community members, academics, policymakers, and interested people from Southeast Michigan and beyond. And we are really, really excited about today's session with the author of Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope by Nicholas Kristof. Before we dig into this conversation, I want to remind our viewers that we want to hear from you. You can submit questions and comments in the comment box to the right on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag Poverty Solutions. We look forward to a meaningful conversation and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. We want an open and respectful dialogue and I want to let folks know that we will be responsive to any appropriate content, any inappropriate content. I invite you to check out our resources, tune in for additional events and find other ways to connect with poverty research at our website, poverty.umich.edu. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Luke Schaefer, Director of Poverty Solutions and author of $2 a Day, who will introduce our speaker and respondents. Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm, I've been excited about this event for a long time. For almost two decades, New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof has traveled the globe to put human faces on devastating problems plaguing the nation, from disease and poverty to violence and exploitation, uh, and also a focus on the efforts of individuals and organizations to do good into the world and to repair it. Today, we're here to talk about his latest book, Tightrope, Americans Reaching for Hope, written with his colleague, Cheryl Wudan. It stays close to home, focusing on the ravages of unemployment, addiction, uh, suicide and despair, and how it's decimated working class America. Following Mr. Kristoff's remarks, we'll hear from Robert Gordon, director of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and Dr. Joné Caldoun, the chief medical executive and chief deputy director of MDHHS, with their thoughts on how many of the issues Kristoff addresses are imp impacting Michigan. Welcome, Nick Kristoff. Thank you. I'm delighted to, to be with you virtually. I just yeah. wish I was there in person. Yeah, us too. Uh, Tightrope is a deeply personal book charting a story about our nation from a starting point of your life and the experiences of people you grew up with. I wonder if you could tell us the story of how you came to write this book. Uh, when did the inspiration come and uh, what first led you down the path to write a book about home rather than going across the world? Well, Cheryl and I were traveling around the world, as you suggest, covering humanitarian crises in South Sudan or Yemen or uh, Myanmar. And meanwhile, I was regularly going back to my hometown in rural Oregon. My mom is still on the family farm. And we saw a, fam uh, a humanitarian crisis unfolding there. Um, I, I'm still close to, you know, it's a small town. It's a thousand people on a good day. And I'm still close to the people on my old school bus. Uh, a quarter of them are now dead from deaths of despair, uh, drugs, alcohol, and suicide. Um, and, and there were just things that were hard to understand. I, I've written a lot about, um, about sexual violence worldwide. And there were two boys on that number six bus who were convicted and imprisoned for raping very young girls. One of them was a good friend of mine. And trying to understand how that happened in a community where we were really proud of our social fabric and, you know, our values and all this. And, you know, it was, it was really wrenching and I didn't know how to process it for a while. And then it increasingly became clear that this wasn't a problem of one bus route or one town, mm -hmm. but a national problem. And, you know, that deaths of despair were bringing down the entire U S life expectancy, even before COVID for three years in a row. And so that's when, you know, we decided to try to, write about this at a, you know, at a, at a national level through the prism of my hometown. And, you know, Luke, I, I think also there was some sense that maybe we in the media had neglected this issue um, for which I felt a certain 
responsibility. I spent a lot of time reporting in Afghanistan and Iraq, and those were, you know, important stories that deserve coverage. But it struck me that every two weeks, more Americans die from these deaths of despair than died in 19 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I don't think we gave that problem here at home its due. Yeah. So um, in your opening comments, you sort of uh, uh, elucidate one of the things I really think is powerful about the book is that you chart people's stories along with the big data, right? Uh, what's going on. And one of the stories that has really stuck with me since I, I read it um, is the one that you start with. So the story of Dean Knapp fleeing her house to avoid her husband, Gary. And I was just curious, um, is that sort of one of the stories that continues to haunt me? Um, what what led you to start the, um, start the book there? What were you trying to communicate? And then are there other stories from the book that really sort of haunt you that way that you, you, you spend time sort of going back to? The Knapp story was, um, you know, particularly moved me because um, the five Knapp kids got in the bus every morning uh, right after I did. They were the next bus stop. And um, the oldest, Farlan, was my year. Uh, his brother is Zeeland, brother Nathan, brother Keelan, and sister Regina. And their family had really done very well, was doing very well when we were all on the bus. Uh, their dad had a job, a union job laying pipe, and they parlayed that into, um, you know, uh, buying their first home. Uh, when Farland turned 16, he got a, uh, the family gave him a Ford Mustang and we were all so jealous of Farland. <laughs> but, you know, and then they, and then, and then Farland died of uh, liver failure connected to drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, uh, Zeeland died in a house fire when he was passed out drunk. Um, Rogina died of hepatitis from injecting drugs. Um, Nathan blew himself up cooking meth. And uh, at the time we wrote the book, Keelan was the sole survivor among the kids. But um, but in fact, as COVID hit, he early this year, he lost his job, spiraled downward and died of a heroin overdose. So all five kids gone. And so, you know, that just, I mean, I just, you know, I think of these five talented kids who had so much going on, going for them. And uh, it feels to me that they, you know, we as a society, we invested in incarcerating the NAPs, but not in educating them, not in supporting them. And I wanted to, I, I began, I mean, so we thought of just telling, you know, beginning the chapter one with the story of the NAPs dying one after the other. But, yeah. but we also wanted to note that, you know, back, in the 1970s, when we were on the bus, it wasn't all great. And there were real, you know, there were real problems like Mr. Knapp beating up Mrs. Knapp daily and firing guns at her. I mean, and that also this, this incredibly toxic, brutal relationship in the house, I think, you know, traumatized the kids and, and the government was completely unhelpful to them. The school was then happy when they dropped out. So, it seemed to us that it was a way of also talking about how we failed the NAPs, you know, way before they failed us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your book is really about um, changes over time and, and trends um, and things that we, we haven't paid enough attention to, but it seems like the, at the start of the book, you're sort of reflecting that um, we do have a tendency to romanticize the past sometimes and wanting to remember that not all was, you know, was well. We have a video um, question for you from one of our students, Alex. Hi, Mr. Kristoff. Uh, my name is Alex. And first off, I just wanted to thank you for coming to speak with us today um, and sharing your insights. Uh, we all really appreciate it. Um, so in your book, you discuss the struggles of yourself and others living in rural America. And my question is, uh, what would you say that the biggest differences in hardship are between living in rural America compared to living elsewhere? Um, it's a it's a good question, Alex. Um, and I I think that um, I mean a couple uh, come to mind. One is healthcare access that you know 
hospitals and also dental care. We tend to think of, you know, medical care, but dental care, I think, is one of those things that we, you know, the, the, the 30 odd million Americans who don't have medical coverage, there are 78 million who don't have dental coverage. And um, so the lack of, of health care options. But I think beyond that is employment. Um, there have been periodically crises of unemployment in urban areas. And I think that, you know, in uh, one of the, we, we write about struggles in, in urban Baltimore. And I think that was one of the factors uh, there when jobs left in the 1960s, et cetera. But, but those problems in urban areas have been episodic. And in general, urban areas in America have added jobs. And in general, uh, jobs in rural areas have declined because of mechanization, increasing productivity. And so historically, we've needed to move people from rural areas to urban areas where the jobs are. And uh, mobility has, in fact, declined over the last generation. So there are a lot of folks um, who just don't get jobs. And that was true in my area. The biggest employer was a glove factory that moved, uh, moved abroad. And I think also one of our general policy failures is that we're not, we're not good at geographic interventions. We, I mean, I think we have some anti-poverty interventions that are really, really powerful, but the geographic ones in general haven't really managed to revitalize, uh, communities very effectively. And, um, so I think that rural America uh, is going to face an ongoing crisis as jobs decline and uh, people then suffer social isolation and uh, loss of self-esteem, uh, despair. You know, one of the problems I think is that this personal responsibility narrative not only leads to not introducing the right policies, but it's also very much internalized by a lot of people who are struggling. And so they often blame themselves for their failures in ways that I think also make it more complicated to address the problems. Alex brings up the, this divide between rural and urban America and in your book really charts ground and helping us understand that. Uh, another thing about your voice is you've been all around the world You've seen a lot of bad things, and in this work, you choose to to stick in the U.S. You know, often considered one of the richest nations in the world. I wonder how you think about the defining challenges of hardship and poverty in America versus some of the other places that you've been. So, um, one of the, I mean, there, there are some conservative skeptics about poverty in America, and they say that you know, X percent of Americans below the poverty line have air conditioners, have color TVs. Mm -hmm. um, have cars, and that so they're not really poor by international standards. And I think that's misleading. Um, you know, it is true that by some of the conventional material standards, uh, you know, people are better off than elsewhere. But um, I was, uh, I've, I've been really intrigued by some of the research that the economist Esther DeFlo and others have done about uh, hope and hopelessness and about mm -hmm. hopelessness becomes self-fulfilling and, and in turn, hope can also become self-fulfilling. And it strikes me that, you know, one of the great common threads between um, people in my community or in West Virginia or in African-American neighborhoods in Baltimore, for example, and also with um, uh, low-income areas in Bangladesh or a slum like Kibera in Kenya, is this sense of lack of hope, uh, just no sense that things can actually get better. And I think one of the reasons why intervention sometimes actually work is not the intervention itself, but it's that it gives people a sense that their future or their kids' futures can be better. We've got a question from Emily Koo. Uh, Trevor, can you pull that up? Hi, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Emily. I'm a current Masters of Social Work student here at the university. And my question is, as someone who lives in an affluent country and writes for an influential publication like the New York Times, as a white male covering issues like poverty, what measures do you take to ensure that the pieces you write are without bias? Thank you. 
Um, you know, look, I would say at the end of the day that um, I, you know, I am biased and, you know, bias is a part of the human condition and how the brain works. And I have biases as a man. I have biases as a white person. I also have biases now as an urban person. I have biases coming from, you know, rural areas. And I, I'm, I, I look at the implicit attitude tests, which the IATs, which I encourage you all to take and which kind of underscore how, how we all tend to be a bundle of biases. And mm. I, um, I, you know, I, I think one recognition is that when you are aware of your biases, that helps to some degree. Um, I think uh, reaching uh, people who uh, from different perspectives and backgrounds and also, you know, ideologies uh, helps as well. Um, and so I, I try to do that. But I, at the end of the day, um, I think that I am going to reflect, you know, is, and and that in general, a lot of mainstream there, there there's a conservative critique that the media are are you know are biased in the sense of having a liberal bias. Um, I think that the greater bias is kind of an urban, um, mm -hmm. urban kind of sensibility bias and that that you know more than racial biases more than sexist biases that that is uh something that one sees in 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 coverage there are very few people from the military who who are in the media uh very few working class people which is probably one reason why working class issues tend to get undercovered um we tend to write about issues that concern us and our neighbors um and you know that I reflect that bias when I write about the issues in tightrope too. So I think it's a, you know, I think it's a really important question, one that we constantly have to interrogate ourselves about, but I don't think, uh, I think biases are really hard to overcome. So being aware of them and also thinking about not just how they help you uh, shape how you perceive a situation, but what questions you're asking. Seems like. Yeah. And, and what, and what things we're not writing about. I think that, I think journalists are sometimes okay at, at uh, being aware of biases when they're writing about a particular issue. But I think we all have biases and also confirmation biases that lead us to self-select information and self-select issues that, that we care about. Um, one of them, I thought one of the most interesting experiments on this um, was uh, looked at NBA refs and mm -hmm. it found that NBA refs uh, are, you know, show racial bias in the, in the fouls that they call. Refs of every race show bias against other races. And um, the NBA was outraged at this uh, study. And there was a lot of, you know, they denounced it, a bad study. <laughs> Actually, it was a really good study. But the benefit of it was that years later, when the study was replicated, it seemed that the bias had gone away. And hmm. the best interpretation yeah, seemed to be that once refs were aware of their own propensity to bias, to for racial bias, that they were able perhaps to address it. Lesson maybe for us all. I believe that study was uh, one of the authors was Justin Wolfers. My That's right. Overall. Yeah. Hey, uh, so this is a book that you co-authored with Cheryl Wudan, who is a, a colleague and a writer, and also you happen to be married to her. Uh, and I just wondered a little bit about uh, how you two work together. And, you know, did the writing process ever lead to moments of discord at the dinner <laughs> table or was it all perfectly smooth? When people ask that, and the, the, the subtext is clearly, how do you guys write books together and stay married? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the truth is, so we have three kids, and if you can raise three kids together and stay married, <laughs> it's a piece yeah. of cake. <laughs> you put a manuscript down at night, and it stays stays down. You um, that's true, uh, right? Yeah. It doesn't talk bad. It doesn't play you off each other. Um, but um, we've written um, we've written all of our books together. Um, it um, and you know, in some areas, it's, I think, been 
uh, important in that way. When we wrote Half the Sky, which is about empowering women worldwide, I think it would have been uh, really weird if it had been just a man writing about that. On the other hand, I fear that if it had been just a woman writing about it, that it would have been marginalized as a woman's book. And I think having a man and a woman write about uh, the toll of oppression against women together uh, was was more effective. Um, mm -hmm. And so we've, um, you know, that we um, uh, we've written these together. We're both very used to being edited because we both have this long journalistic. Uh, background and so um, and we tend to edit each other very heavily and you know we I sometimes glare at Cheryl after she's edited my <laughs> I recover quickly <laughs> lots of red pen treatment yeah a lot of it a lot of it you know in many ways uh, tightrope is a is a pretty depressing book um, you know in some ways it may even be more depressing than my own book, uh, which uh, doesn't happen that much, but in, in other ways, uh, there's also a lot of hope. And uh, as you were, you were just sort of reflecting on sort of deep disadvantage or deep poverty being connected to a sense of hopelessness. So I'm wondering, like, what are what are some of the places where you draw from hope from this work? So, you know, I am hopeful, not just in general about this, but actually particularly at this time. And so my, my reason for hope essentially is that I think that today, in contrast to maybe 25 years ago, we really know what works to address these problems, uh, partly because other countries have been effective at addressing them. You know, we're not going to eliminate poverty in America or child poverty in America, but can we reduce it substantially? I think absolutely. And the fact that other countries have been able to do that suggests to me that we have a toolbox that works. We certainly have the resources as a country. And what we lack is, is the political will. Um, and I think also maybe the narratives that would sustain the kind of uh, interventions to, to make good. And, and so, you know, if we know the toolbox um, that works and, and the, um, you know, and the resources, um, then, it becomes a function of having the right political moment. And I, I think that for the last 50 years, um, uh, the US has been, I don't think this is just about Trump. I think he's in many ways a symptom of a broader mm -hmm. uh, underinvestment in human capital. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I think it goes back 50 years. I think it's partly rooted in racism and the Nixon Southern strategy and the idea that if we invest in um, low income Americans, then we will be disproportionately uh, investing in people of color. And I think that, uh, you know, that is part of what has happened. And Arthur Schlesinger talked about cycles of history. I, I wonder if we're not ending that cycle even before COVID came along. And, you know, I look at, um, well, I think partly um, as white communities began to suffer many of these issues, sort of a generation or half a generation after, after African-American communities, then there was clearly much more establishment sympathy for those suffering. And so we reframed issues, you know, if you look at addiction, we reframed it from um, junkies mm -hmm. who should be tossed in jail to people in need of treatment. Mm -hmm. And that was a double standard, it was hypocritical, but it certainly makes it easier to introduce evidence-based policies. Um, likewise, you have red states like, uh, like Idaho, uh, Utah, that that expanded Medicaid. You had Texas leading the way to retreat from mass incarceration. Um, so it seems to me that there was already perhaps a move. Um, you know, Kansas. You think about you know Kansas was the state under Sam Brownback that cut uh, cut taxes and as a result cut investments in in education. And then it was so bad that Kansas Republicans rebelled and said tax us more because they saw how badly the schools were yeah. being hit. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've sort of wondered if that tide hasn't already been turning. And then I think COVID creates a little extra argument because we see how badly the country has failed. And the, the, in a, at a time of chronic disease, the failures of lack of national healthcare may not be so evident. In a time of infectious disease, they should be even more manifest. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hoping that, um, this will be a sort of 1932 election that, you know, 1932, um, Franklin Roosevelt was uh, elected with a big mandate and flipped the Senate, uh, partly because 
the failures of the U.S. in the Great Depression had been so obvious to all, and because Herbert Hoover had done such a poor job uh, running the country, and that laid the basis for the New Deal and and policy interventions that really made a difference for a vast number of Americans. Yeah. So touch wood. <laughs> so um, let's uh, stick on that for just a minute. And in uh, in the book, you sort of lay out a few policy recommendations that um, having looked at the evidence, you've sort of moved towards. And uh, I'm wondering now, in in light of everything that's gone on since since you finished writing the book, what are, what are some of the first things you'd like to see a, a federal government uh, enact uh, that would address the long-term issues and the, and the short term as well? Well, boy, there are, there are a whole bunch. Um, but above all, I would focus on children and, and young children. And partly, I think that one of the reasons our anti-poverty efforts haven't been more effective is that we, too often we start too late. And when I try to think what would have made a difference for the nap kids, mm -hmm. boy, I think, you know, um, early childhood and, you know, and even to some degree beginning uh, during pregnancy. And so um, I would, uh, well, one thing that you are the expert on and, I, uh, and I've learned a lot from you about them is child allowances. You know, the fact that Canada has used them, that Britain has used them, that continental Europe, that Australia has used them to reduce child poverty, um, I think is, um, uh, is really powerful evidence that they work and one can, use other names for them. Um, but that rubric of child allowances is sending a monthly, uh, a monthly uh, check to a family with a child. Um, and I, I think is, uh, you know, the, there was a, as you know, better than I, there was a, a, a good National Academies study that suggested that uh, for about 100 billion a year, we could reduce child poverty in half in America. Uh, using child allowances. And so that would be, um, you know, that would be uh, just about at the top of my agenda. And the, you know, the other thing also about early childhood would be some kind of a national, uh, national high quality pre-K, mm -hmm. um, which would also include pre-pre-K interventions, you know, the zero to three space, uh, home visitation, things like that. And I think that um, that polls really well. Um, Mm -hmm. And it polls particularly well if, um, and I think a lot of poverty specialists and child specialists think that the really important reason to have a national pre-K is the benefits to the child. But <laughs> what seems to poll particularly well is the benefits to childcare uh, and to working parents. Mm -hmm. And so really it that. may be better to present it as a national childcare program, um, but however it's presented, it's fundamentally the same thing. And I think that would also make a huge difference uh, in putting this country on a better track. I appreciate you letting me uh, fish for that uh, child <laughs> answer, but uh, yeah, it's great to uh, hear about it from you. Uh, that's the federal level. And in a minute, um, we, uh, because of some interest of yours and some close uh, colleagues that we have, uh, we're going to invite uh, Robert Gordon, uh, Director of Health and Human Services for the state of Michigan, uh, and then Jone, Dr. Jonay Kaldun, the Chief Medical Executive and a Deputy Director of the department, to come and talk in, about what states can do and what Michigan can do in particular. So I wonder if you could just, uh, before we transition to them, um, we're going to have them cover the states, and you talk about the federal government. Uh, we've got a, uh, a question from Bill S. who really says, what about communities? And maybe some of the evidence from COVID is that uh, we shouldn't always look to the federal government to solve, solve our challenges. Um, what about um, uh, small towns and cities? What, what should they be doing? So, um, you know, it always strikes me as a little bit crazy in the U.S. that there is this, you know, that the so, I mean, liberals tend to think, okay, we, we intervene with government interventions to make a difference. And conservatives tend to think, oh, it's, we have to do a thousand points of light. We have to do, you know, volunteer organizations and so on. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, to bring about change, I think any, any, any intervention whatsoever is important. And we, we do whatever we need and we do it. We need it at the federal level, at the state level, at the town level, Both uh, community organization. We need, you know, everything we can get. Um, and I also think that, I mean, depending on, so for the last 10 years or so, um, federal, 
um, interventions have essentially been blocked by political paralysis. And so what has happened has been largely at the state or community level. And so, you know, Oklahoma has kind of amazing early childhood programs. Um, uh, and that's that was only possible because it, ha it, it happened at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, if the Senate flips, then and the and there's no veto, then that may be things may be possible again at the federal level. But there, one advantage of federalism is experimentation. And, you know, a lot of these things, we really don't know particularly what works. Um, um, dealing with addiction is, you know, addiction is a really, really hard issue to wrestle with. And um, it, um, uh, and it, I think, you know, this is a case where experimentation could maybe give us some sense of what works. Um, Dr. Caldoun earlier was in Baltimore and I saw a fantastic lead uh, reduction program in Baltimore and, you know, lead elevated lead levels are a huge problem across the country. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe things like that can happen at the local level. But I, I would just also caution that, you know, we would never try to build an interstate highway system with volunteers and bake sales. And in the same way, when we have so many kids um, suffering so unnecessarily, when our country is being held back uh, because of lack of investment in the human capital of the next generation, then I think, again, uh, we can't rely just on volunteers and bake sales, but we need government interventions in the way that we had during the New Deal. Okay. I'm going to invite uh, first uh, Director Gordon to come on if we have him. Go ahead. Hey, Robert. Hey, Luke. Thanks for having me. The floor to you. Great. Well, it's wonderful listening to Nick Kristoff, obviously, a uh, longtime reader and, and deeply engaged with this theme of, of deaths of despair. And worth saying, it's one we're confronting right now with COVID. Um, I'd be remiss uh, talking to a group of students if I didn't start out by saying this is such a difficult time for Michigan, for the country on COVID. I know it's on all of our minds. Uh, we all have to be so very careful about wearing masks, social distancing, particularly among students. Um, I think behind that and behind our effort, and I want to link what we're doing with COVID with the themes of this conversation, our, our prof the profoundest belief behind our response as a state is that each life has intrinsic profound worth and equal value. And in the United States, that shouldn't need saying, but deeply it does. And we see the ways in which it does in, in having to push back in, in the narrow sense of the COVID response against suggestions that maybe people who are older or people who have pre-existing conditions might be expendable or might be people who somehow brought this upon themselves. We see it if you think about the way that COVID has highlighted race and racial disparities and has driven uh, enormous and horrible racial disparities in, in the impacts of COVID. Um, but I also think going back even further and thinking about this conversation about deaths of despair and those of us on the political left think about the ways in which urban rural divides and divides about education have left us sometimes to talk in ways that lead us to say that people with less education or people living in different parts, parts of the country that they're leading lives of less value. So I think it's 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 a cross-cutting theme that we confront as a country in different ways. And it's one that we are trying to address in Michigan and in, in you know in the the Department of Health and Human Services with Dr. Caldeon and I are, are honored to lead together. So I'll talk a little bit about the human services response. I'll leave Dr. J to talk a little bit about the health response. We have tried as a department, and you talked a lot about, about hope, to orient around certain core values. And, and those are this idea of the intrinsic human dignity of each person, the idea that it is our job and our responsibility to enable people to take full advantage of the benefits that we're able to offer, and the idea that these benefits actually have real value to families. And I think we, we push back upon decades of folks saying for all kinds of reasons, uh, either that people aren't deserving of these benefits or that if they get benefits, it's going to hurt them. And we now have decades of research, including research by you, Luke, that really shows the power of creating a floor for people and how it's, it's with a floor that people are able to rise up and that without that, they're always scrambling. So I think there's two big aspects to this response and, and Mr. Christoph touched on this a little bit. Um, one is, is 
bringing that floor to a decent level. We don't expect that in the United States. It's not the norm. Michigan, unfortunately, uh, even in the world of post-welfare, uh, post-welfare reform benefits, the cash benefits that we provide are incredibly uh, parsimonious. And yet we know that if, if you give family the basics, things like a, a child allowance, it's gonna be good for that family. It's gonna be good for that child throughout that child's life. So we have done what we can in a state with a divided legislature to increase the availability of benefits and things like um, raising asset levels, raising asset tests so that uh, you can save a little bit and still get benefits when you fall into a hole. That's been an important part of our response. And we would love to be able to do more of it. And a lot of it depends on what happens on Tuesday and beyond more than a little bit. There's a second idea, which, which for me, as someone who's mostly an administrator rather than a policymaker, is really important, which is what matters is not only the level of benefits, but the way that you provide them. And, and in our society, and again, because of these, this, the downward look that I think so many people have, have given to people who come into a public assistance office, people have seen it as their job to make it hard, to make someone who comes and make them pay, make them jump through a lot of hoops, that we're doing them a favor somehow, that it's, they have to prove their worth and we're toughening them. And it's a terrible attitude, actually. It, just, it, it kicks lots of people out of benefits that they're entitled to. And it, in, in a world where um, we all know that um, uh, uh, it is expensive and hard being poor, the government is often making it harder. And so what mattered here when you think about something like asset tests is not only that we said that if you had as little as $50 for some benefits in the bank, you couldn't access help, emergency help, but also that we made you come in with your bank statement or proof that you lost your job in, you know, in triplicate. And um, we, we, we had a situation with people coming in homeless shelters, asking for a sandwich, asking if they can get SNAP, and we were telling them, we need your bank account. And, and they're there for clothes and for a sandwich. And, and either they can't find it or they come in with a bank account and it's a whole scramble, and, you know, they're, you know, they're overdrawn, that's what their bank account says. And so we were able to make a change and say, no, we don't need your, your we don't need that form. If, if you are in these categories, we're gonna take your word for it. And we'll have an audit process for the person who maybe we think is cheating. We can deal with that on the back end as a special case and not as the normal case. And so that's a philosophical shift and it's a philosophical shift to say, and to root in all of our programs to say, that there is this deep belief in human dignity and that we expect people to be treated with respect. And it's, it's a simple thing, but it's interesting for our staff who are, you know, thousands of people at the Michigan Department of Health and Serve, Human Services, nobody's there for the money. They're there because they want to help, but it does matter the messages that come from the person in my seat or Dr. Caldeon's seat or Governor Whitmer's seat. And so we really have tried to say, send the message that we meet people as equals and it's job to provide benefits on as even-handed and simple and respectful a basis as we can. And the last thing I'll say that relates to that, and again, ties into this theme of despair, is just, um, I think, respecting people in their economic condition matters and respecting people about their mental health matters and the challenges that they face. And so one small good thing, I think, to come out of this COVID moment is all of us know something now about mental health challenges. All of us know personally what it means to be under enormous strain, to feel beyond what is our comfort zone, um, and to feel pushed. And we have been able to message very deeply and extensively things like it's okay not to be okay. And we have a new campaign that's called Be Kind to Your Mind. And we've greatly expanded the availability of counseling services. We have like seven flavors of them for people with different kinds of needs. So if you have long-term serious mental health challenges, we have peer counselors who often have had those experiences themselves. Um, if you're a young, if you're the kind of person who wants to talk mental health by text messaging and not, not on the phone, we have a text service, which is actually really popular. Um, so we're trying to meet people and we have an, an all purpose one, which we just announced actually, you can just call an 800 number, it's free, it's confidential, anyone in Michigan can get it, no insurance needed. So we've tried to create these different channels and we tried beyond that to have an, a broad message about the dignity of everyone who struggled. And hopefully if something good comes out of this moment, as all of us struggle, we'll have a little bit more empathy for that. So um, I will stop there, um, uh, honored to be with you and I guess uh, turn it over to Dr. Kelly.
Luke, I think you're yeah. muted. Yeah. yeah. We're, we'll bring Dr. Caldoun on as well and, and give her a few minutes to reflect. And then uh, we'll, we'll turn it back to you for um, uh, some response. All right, so um, hello everyone. Uh, really excited to join the conversation today. Also a big fan of, of Mr. Christoph. Uh, again, was excited when you came and visited in, in Baltimore uh, many years ago, but uh, excited to be here today. Uh, really enjoyed reading, reading Tightrope. I think it was a really unique and personal account of how poverty, lack of resources, how it contributes to not only the, the health and kind of the outcomes of that one individual, but really you got into that concept of multi-generational poverty and kind of the subsequent uh, health outcomes that come from that. And I think it's often um, missed when we talk about that in the, in the health uh, and human services uh, perspective, especially in the health side. I mean, people focus on what's right there in front of you, but it's not just about that mother, that child. It's about them when they're grandparents and the outcomes for their children. I think you also importantly point out um, that these are not coincidental things, right? These are systems level challenges. These are choices, quite frankly, that America has made as far as how we want to treat people. And I think one of my favorite quotes from, from the book is your, your end point is determined by your, your starting point. And I think we really have to think differently about poverty, health, understand their interconnectedness, understand the um, interconnectedness with race, which you touch on a lot in, in the book as well. Um, and then move forward with policies that, that really achieve optimal health for everyone, no matter where you, you may start. And again, I remember when I was in Baltimore, we talked a lot about um, you know, your, your zip code. You could literally walk two blocks away and your life expectancy drops you know, by 20 years. Same thing when I was Detroit health commissioner. It's just, it's, it's what it is in America and your zip code should not determine your health. Uh, so there, was, there were several things um, that actually resonated for me in the, in the book. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. So as I said, used to be the, the chief medical officer in Baltimore. You talked a lot about Baltimore um, in tightrope. And, and one of the things, speaking to the opioid epidemic in Baltimore, that, that I really uh, was really impressed by, I mean, Baltimore is the still is the um, oldest continually running uh, local health department in, in the country. And I think they really hit the nail on the head when it comes to uh, meeting people where they are. One of my favorite things to do um, in, in Baltimore, and again, we're, I'll get to this, but we're building this out in Michigan as well, was being on the needle exchange van. So we, we literally had these um, syringe exchange programs that were based in the community. I mean, literally, uh, you would be on them, uh, well-respected in the community, people who are struggling with substance use disorders, and I mean, it sounds a little weird, but we knew who the people were who were dealing the drugs. And they would say hi to you when you came on the van. And they literally, people, they would send people to our van to be able to get services because, you know, that's just kind of, I hate to say it, but like a somewhat of a symbiotic relationship. I'm not saying that's that's the goal, but, but it's just the reality of what was happening. On the vans, I mean, we had needle exchange. We had wound care, actually, because, again, people who are using you know, IV drugs, you know, sometimes having wound issues. We had wound care, nurses on the van. You could go into the back of the van. You'd have your naloxone training that you could do. You could leave with your naloxone life, you know, saving overdose reversal drug in hand. They would give it out to their friends as well. It, it was it was really just meeting people where they were. Um, we had a stabilization center. So this concept, of, I'm also an emergency medicine physician. In the ER, I mean, any given, especially Friday, Saturday night, people are being brought in across this country, um, being arrested for intoxication or just coming into an ER where quite frankly, we don't do anything when you're intoxicated except wait till you're awake. We make sure you're medically okay. We wait till you're awake and then we kick you out the door as quickly as we can because we've got a full waiting room. So uh, this concept of a stabilization center where uh, you take people not to a not to a jail. You don't take them to an ER, but you take them to a warm, safe place where they can their their intoxication can kind of wear off. You've got peer recovery supports right there when they when they wake up. You can connect them if they're ready to the appropriate services, and if they're not ready, at least they had a safe place. They didn't go to jail. They didn't go into a crowded ER, um, and you and you get them ready for the next time. So again, a lot of great work that we did there. I think. Um, these are the types of programs, so harm reduction, meeting people where they are. In Michigan, we're expanding our syringe exchange program significantly. We're expanding access to naloxone. Um, we're, we're also uh, working with many emergency departments uh, across the state so that when people are coming in with, with opioid overdoses, you're connecting them with treatment right there. Um, and, and it really is best practice um, that we're, we're excited to roll out across the state. I think it's, uh, again, something else that was brought up in the book 
is, you know, addiction is not a moral failing. Um, addiction is about a chemical imbalance in the brain. You wouldn't tell someone, again, Lena Wen and I would say this all the time, you know, you wouldn't say tell someone with diabetes, you know, why are you taking insulin still? You come into my ER every every week, you know, taking taking insulin or needing to be admitted. We don't shame them, but we shame people who are struggling with substance use disorders. And we have to think about that differently. One thing you also touched on in the book uh, was, was this concept of this issue of maternal mortality and, and why does the United States um, have the worst maternal mortality rate of, of any other wealthy country? Um, why does an African-American woman uh, have three times the likelihood of dying from a, a pregnancy-related condition as a white woman in this country? Again, these are not coincidences. These are not things um, that are that are by happenstance. They're not related to a skin color per se. I can tell you my own personal story, uh, obviously African-American woman. Um, I similarly had a struggle with the labor of my first child. I was having a bad headache. Um, quite frankly, I ended up having a, a really bad head bleed. And I'll tell you, if I did not have uh, a bunch of ER doctors on speed dial on my cell phone, I would likely not be here today. And that is what my neurosurgeon told me. Um, so this concept of why do you have to be connected with your own personal doctors uh, to be able to live? Why do um, we not have the programs in place such that not only at the point of delivery, but throughout the entire pregnancy uh, and before pregnancy, right? It's, we can't think of women as baby carrying vessels. How can we think about collective health um, pre, during, and after pregnancy? So some of the things we're working on in Michigan, really just incredibly proud of, of Governor Whitmer, the leadership of Director Gordon, um, expanding access to uh, insurance, just Medicaid in general, right? That, that's, that's promoting a woman's health. Expanding access to Medicaid postpartum, we're working on that now, expanding it to 12 months postpartum in Medicaid. Expanding access to, to contraception so that families uh, can can choose how they want to grow their 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 families, right? So those are things that are incredibly important and, and things we're working on in Michigan. And finally I have to touch on COVID uh, as as well. I think it was it was really no surprise uh, that we found when we when we looked. Um, and Michigan was one of the first states. Uh, thank you, Luke, earlier for for recognizing that one of the first states to um, look at and post publish data on race and ethnicity when it comes to COVID related cases and deaths. And again, no surprise, African Americans are 15% of uh, the population in Michigan at the time with our initial surge in the spring. 30% of cases, 40% of deaths. But when you think about what the reasons for that are, it has nothing to do with skin color. It's about when everyone else, and probably everyone on this in this meeting right now, when we were told to shelter in place, uh, we could go and kind of you know order however much $500 worth of food to be delivered to our houses. We didn't have to go out. We could work from home we had paid, uh, you know, paid leave or computers, whatever. We didn't have a child care issue because, you know, everyone in the household has a decent paying job. Uh, we didn't have to go out and, and work. We weren't essential workers per se, meaning we didn't have to go and drive the public transportation. We didn't have to go and work in the grocery store. Um, when it, Even when it comes to isolation with COVID-19, you know, the CDC guidelines say, you know, find a separate bathroom in your house. Let's be real here. How many people Yes, I do. That's my privilege right now. How many people have a separate bathroom, let alone a separate room or a room, period, where they can live uh, safely uh, from COVID-19? So the reality is we perpetuated health disparities just by the nature of what COVID is. And again, this is not new. This is what happens when you, when you systematically deny populations of people from resources. It's not about the color of their skin. So anyway, just really excited, really enjoyed reading the book. Um, and excited for the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Khaldun. Um, Nick, we're gonna send it back over to you for a, a, a few responses. That was quite, we threw a lot at you there, but. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, first of all, I'm just really impressed by the things that Michigan, you know, is doing. And it just reminds me that I, I do think maybe one problem in the way we in journalism cover uh, poverty, both at home and abroad, and to some degree, the way uh, aid organizations likewise address it, is that it's presented as this big, huge, almost hopeless problem, uh, almost perpetual problem. And I think that we often leave the public with the perception that there's, no, there's kind of nothing one can do about it. And, um, you know, I, uh, I think that what 
you've shown is that uh, you know it it there are no wands to wave, but there are real things we can do um, to mitigate it. And I, uh, first of all, you're, the point you both made about COVID, I that's one thing I'm really worried about nationally. That I, that you know we we have um, a problem of lack of access to healthcare, and COVID magnified it in part because we have this crazy system where you get your insurance for your job, and then you know then 11 million people lose their jobs, and um, likewise, clearly a problem. One of the things that really struck me in reporting Tightrope was the importance of jobs, not only as an income stream, but as a source of identity, a purpose, of meaning in life. And now, again, so many fewer people have jobs. One of the things we explored was social isolation and the way it, it leads to all kinds of other problems. And, you know, by some estimates is more deadly than obesity. And, you know, what do we have now? It's uh, social uh, isolation. And, uh, and, and of course, many people not getting cancer screenings in ways that will probably lead to more deaths from cervical cancer and colon cancer in the years to come. Uh, kids not getting vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think the COVID point I totally agree on. And um, I, again, this notion that there are these little things that collectively make a big difference. And I sometimes think it, it, you know, it's hard to get the public excited about little things, but it always seems to me that that's kind of what works. And I think of, um, I, I just love the public health model uh, as a way, as a framework through looking at problems even that aren't medical or really health related, like poverty. And I think about the way we reduced uh, auto fatalities. Uh, they've been reduced by 95% since 1921. And it was not one thing or five, you know, it, it was a million things. It was seat belts and airbags and padded dashboards and um, divided highways and lights on roads and graduated licenses for young people and crackdowns on drunken driving, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, no one thing moved the needle so much, but by a kind of process of relentless empiricism and a process that was not ideological, but was really driven by science and evidence, we were able to have a fantastic impact on, on the well-being of Americans and save an awful lot of lives. And I wish that we could replicate that commitment to evidence and science and depoliticize issues of poverty to the same degree. Um, and, you know, that, I just, you know, I guess my final point would be that I think to do that, I think we have to tackle the narratives that I think have impeded America on in addressing poverty. And I think fundamentally what has kept us back has been a narrative that is partly that the government can't do anything right and partly a narrative that it's all about personal responsibility and bad choices. And, um, you know, when you have th three counties in the U.S. that have a shorter life expectancy than Cambodia or Bangladesh, it's not because those infants are making bad choices at birth. It's because we as a society are making bad choices. Um, you know, or if you use the auto fatality example, um, there's no doubt that people get into car crashes because they make some bad choices or they're, they're not personally responsible. They drive too fast. They text while they drive. They drink and they drive. Um, but we have a system in place that mitigates the consequences of bad choices. Um, and in contrast, in the, in the social realm, you know, we do the equivalent of putting spikes in dashboards to really teach people a lesson. Uh, and I would hope that we could adopt a more compassionate, evidence-based approach that acknowledges that bad choices are real, but that we can together mitigate the consequences of them in ways that will help those individuals and society as a whole. I'm going to take the uh, line relentless, relentless empiricism. I, uh, I like that a lot. Um, in a minute, I'll give uh, uh, Robert and Jonay a chance to, uh, we only got about six more minutes. I want to go, go through just a handful of questions that we got um, from the audience. The first actually comes from um, one of our co-sponsors is the William Davidson Institute here on campus that has a focus on entrepreneurship internationally, a focus on uh, targeting uh, poverty uh, internationally. And I know um, we as a, as a world have been making progress um, abroad. And, uh, and of course, COVID brought some of that to a grinding halt. I wonder if you could 
just offer any remarks on um, sort of what you're seeing in that vein and, and what you think the future holds. Um, that's, that's to me, Luke, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I think we've, there's been a, some a sort of a misperception that the big problem abroad is uh, in poor countries is COVID itself. And, you know, clearly COVID is killing people in India and Pakistan and Kenya and so on. But the biggest impact is the impact on the economy and on closure. So it's uh, the suspension of polio eradication efforts, suspension of vitamin A distribution, uh, vitamin A supplementation, uh, uh, emergency food seed feeding, uh, emer emergency school feedings. Um, the uh, UNFPA, I think, estimates that another 13 million girls will uh, suffer child marriages because of, uh, because of COVID. Um, and, you know, and that uh, another, I forget how many more million girls will suffer female genital mutilation as a result of this because FGM countermeasures aren't being undertaken. And so there's this whole, you know, panoply of secondary consequences. And I'm, I, I would, I think it's very likely that the death toll will be greater from malnutrition, um, which already is yeah. linked to 45% of under five de of, of deaths of children under five, uh, rather than people dying specifically of the virus itself. Um, and I don't think, you know, there are things we in the West could do um, to mitigate these consequences. And it's everything from supporting vaccine efforts uh, to the malnutrition efforts. And we are not doing them because we are and the rest of the industrialized world is so inwardly focused right now. Mm -hmm. Hey, um, my colleague, Professor Trina Shanks, um, mentions that we talked a little bit about cash transfers. Um, there's a lot of interest in addressing wealth inequality and assets and um, uh, a lot of talk. We had our colleague here, Derek Hamilton, to talk about uh, baby bonds a year or two ago. Do you have thoughts in sort of the wealth sphere of how we intervene? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a, a big believer in conditional cash, tra cash transfers. I'm a little more skeptical about unconditional cash transfers in the international sphere. Um, but uh, and baby bonds, uh, I'm a, a big believer on. And we had um, there were a lot of really rigorous experiments in uh, in baby bonds uh, called uh, IDAs, individual development accounts. And they were done with randomized controlled trials. And it and they, from my point of view, they were fantastically successful um, <laughs> before the program was dropped. Um, and but it seems to me that a lot of the current talk about about uh, baby bonds misses some of the elements that were particularly effective the last time around. And one of the lessons from IDAs was that they were often most effective when paired with financial literacy training, um, and also that IDAs were more effective when there were options of uh, matching um, matching donations to the IDA. Mm -hmm. And uh, so again, I think there's need for robust experimentation, uh, again, so to see what works, but at least from the previous round, I think it'd be worth including elements of the uh, matching donations, including like a three to one uh, match uh, the previous time and, and also financial literacy. Uh, and boy, they were just, I mean, they really, they were profoundly helpful um, last time around. And I think also they're politically more palatable to conservatives um, who doubt government programs. Um, uh, and, and also sort of related to that, I think one of the lessons to me is trying to sell programs is that I think we're often more effective if we use the word inequality less and the word opportunity more. Mm -hmm. And uh, the opportunity is, Inequality tends to be a word that liberals like, but tends not to be persuasive to conservatives. Uh, opportunity tends to be a word that uh, that conservatives like well, and it's, it's often easier to get support for a program across the aisle if it's based on opportunity. Thank you. Um, we're gonna. I'm just gonna do one more round robin with our last minute or so. Director Gordon, any any final thoughts, reflections? No, it's great to be with all of you. I guess I'll just say, I think this point about uh, understanding uh, that asking for responsibility, demanding responsibility from people often backfires. And I would just add, 
it also is exactly what feeds the perception of government that's incompetent because you create these incredibly complicated programs like work requirements for, for healthcare in Michigan. It's not a well-conceived idea to begin with, but implementing it is impossible and ties everyone in not. So there is a better, smarter, more dignified and also more efficient way to do it, but great to be with you. Dr. Caldean. All right. Um, no, I mean, really great conversation. Again, honored to be here. You know, for me, I go back to what you talked about with with hope. Um, it's actually one of the themes, you know, within our department is kind of, you know, spreading hope. We said spread hope, not COVID, <laughs> but a hope is just a theme in our department. But I, but I think you, you're hitting on something because, you know, I've, I've worked on violence prevention efforts and done research there, qualitative interviews, and there's this perception that there's no hope. There's nothing different for me. This is just what life is. And I think that the more that we can um, kind of engage communities and, and bring them resources and also not see everyone as have as a lack, but think about the resilience in communities. You know, oftentimes people are talking about Detroit and oh, Detroit doesn't have this. They don't have to have that. Five generations of my family are from Detroit and they, they've got great assets and resilience. And that's why Detroit is, is coming back now because of those people. So I think about hope. I think about building the community. I mean, as we move forward, uh, there will be a post COVID uh, pandemic world, uh, how we can think about hopefully changing the way we think as a society about our communities and, and, and inspiring them uh, with hope and resources and, and thinking differently. And then we'll see what happens on Tuesday. Nick will give you the last word. Um, I think that sometimes there's a misperception in the public that while these problems that we're talking about are unfortunate, that they're an in inevitable consequence of, of uh, mechanization, of uh, broader social trends. And clearly those are challenges. I mean, there, you know, you see in Canada and in, in Germany that those present, those do tend to create some pressure for inequality, but you also see that they don't have the problems that we have. And so going, you know, back to that sense of choice, these, we have made our bed. The, we, the problems the U.S. has are because of policy choices that we as a country made, mistakes, I think. And uh, well, Tuesday <laughs> is a chance to, uh, I think, rectify some of them. And I hope a new administration will look carefully at policies. And there are so many countries that are doing a better job at addressing these issues. I hope we can learn from them. Thank you. Director Gordon, uh, Dr. Caldoun, Nicholas Kristoff, thanks so much for spending the hour uh, with us. It's been uh, a highlight for me. And um, uh, Nick, we hope you'll come uh, see us in person someday if that's ever an opportunity that it, uh, you know, uh, presents itself. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. And uh, we will see you again uh, next week for one more great session. Thanks to all.